Hello and welcome to today's revision session on the paper one topics for AQA A level physics for the 2022 examinations. So in today's revision session we're going to look at how to answer examination questions for paper one of AQA A level physics. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson we should be able to answer A level physics examination style questions, assess our understanding on A level physics and understand what topics we need to improve upon for A level physics. So how do you carry out this particular revision session? Well, well, when completing your work in this revision session, divide your piece of paper into two sections. Make the section on the left hand side larger than the right hand side. And in the left hand side section, write down your answers and you work and out to questions in this revision session. When you do this, make sure you write your answers in full sentences and show your full working out. And whilst in the right hand side, write down any piece of information which you find useful or any hints and tips on answering questions from this revision session. And at the end of the revision session, or write up these notes into a revision sheet for you to use independently. So how should you be revising AQA A-level physics? So first step is learn the key facts. So use your revision guides, your class workbooks, your student prep notes, your textbooks to learn the key ideas of the course. This could include making mind maps or writing out notes yourself. Step two is use your, is to test yourself. So use your Caboodle uh, e-learning platform, Seneca platform, the st a student knowledge checker to quickly test your own knowledge and you may do this when making your own cue cards. And step three is practice examination style questions. So use exam prep books, homework books, supervised study books, additional workbooks to answer exam questions and mark your own work. So you may wish to download your own exam past papers to do this. So this idea of learning the key facts, then testing yourself and retrieving your knowledge before practicing exam style questions and reflecting on your performance is the way to revise AQA A-level physics. So let's have a look at a few questions questions on the different topics which will come up on the exam in this summer of 2022. So let's first look at particle physics. So the first question says photoelectrons are emitted from a sodium surface when it is illuminated with monochromatic electromagnetic radiation. The stopping potential of these photoelectrons is 3.42 volts. Show that the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons is approximately 5.5 times 10 to the minus 19 joules and then calculate the wavelength of the radiation that's in on the sodium surface when the wave function of sodium is 2.36 eV. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, in this particular question, you've got to be aware that you're, you're trying to work, show that the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons is that particular value. Now, how you can work it through is as follows. Well, you are told that the stopping potential is 3.42 volts. Now, you can equate the stopping potential to the kinetic energy when you say that the el electrical potential energy equals the kinetic energy. Okay, so you would you would convert the stopping potential into electrical potential energy, which is equal equal to the kinetic energy by multiplying the, poten the stopping potential by E, the charge of the electron. So to get your answer, you would do 3.42 times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which is the charge of an electron. And that gives you 5.47 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now on this next question, you've got to be aware of the, photo of the um, equation for the photoelectric effect. And that is that the energy of the photon HF is equal to the work function plus the kinetic energy. Now in the previous question you've worked out your kinetic energy. Now it's important to note that you've got to convert your work function into joules by doing 2.36 times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 to convert it back into um, joules. We can then work out what our value for hf is. We can then say E is equal to HC over lambda. So E, which we work through there, or we could also, which E equals HF, we can then use that to then work out lambda by using that particular equation. Another way you could have possibly done it is to work out the frequency because you're going to have the value of E in total because you'll add your stopping potential in joules to your, um, sorry, your work function in joules to your kinetic energy in joules. You would then add that to find the total energy. You could then divide that by Planck's constant h to work out f and then do c equals f lambda okay and say lambda equals c three times ten to the eight okay over the frequency you've calculated to get 2.15 times 10 to the minus 7 meters the next question says 
the frequency f of the electromagnetic radiation is now varied. The maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons is measured for each value of f. Figure 2 shows the variation of the kinetic energy with f. Magnesium and cesium surfaces are also illuminated with electromagnetic radiation and photoelectrons are emitted from the surface. Draw on figure 2 lines to show the variation of ek max with f for magne magnesium and for cesium and label your lines and you're given the work function of magnesium and cesium. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, it's very important that you note, okay, on a kinetic energy against frequency graph for the photoelectric effect, you know what each um, part of the graph represents. So you should be aware that the negative y-intercept is your work function. You should know that your x-intercept is the stopping, uh, so was the, it's going to be the threshold frequency, and then the gradient of the line is going to be Planck's constant. Now, because Planck's constant is a constant, as the name suggests, that indicates to us that the gradient gradient of the three lines, the one on the graph and the one for magnesium and cesium, are going to be the same gradients. That's important. The next thing is that the work function is the negative y-intercept. So your magnesium should be intercepting your um, y-axis at minus 3.68 and your uh, work function of cesium will be intercepting at minus 2.4. Obviously, in theory, it should be in joules on the um, on the y-axis, but because we're just sketch it, we're just drawing, sketching them in. You don't need to convert them. But the important thing to note is the gradient for both the lines is the same because the gradient is the Planck constant, whilst the magnesium line is lower because it's got a higher work function. The next question says. Um, figure 3 shows apparatus that can be used to investigate the photoelectric effect. The experiment is conducted in a vacuum. The photoelectrons are, that are produced move towards the conducting cage. The stopping potential, V, of the photoelectrons is measured using a circuit connected to the metal and the conducting cage. A small amount of air now leaks into the apparatus. Explain how the measured value of V is affected by the presence of air. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, it's very important to understand what is actually going on. The measured value of V, which is the stopping potential, is when all of the kinetic energy of your photoelectrons, when they're being emitted from the metal surface, is, has that converted into electrical potential energy due to the repulsion. So as a result, we've got to understand what happens if air goes into the apparatus. Well, the air particles will go into the apparatus, they will collide with the photoelectrons moving through the apparatus, and as they collide, it would dissipate some of the kinetic energy out of the photoelectrons because they're colliding with them. So that means there's going to be less kinetic energy for the for to for the photoelectrons to transfer into electrical potential energy. So therefore, the stopping potential is going to be lower because there's not as much kinetic energy there to transfer into electrical potential. The next question says, figure one shows some of the energy levels of a single atom. The atom is in its ground state. A photon of 8.81 eV is instant on the atom. Describe a likely outcome of this event. And then multiple atoms with the same energy levels are shown in figure one, and they return to the ground state. How many different photons can be observed? So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, it's very important you understand what could happen. So you've got to look at either the idea of excitation taking place or ionization taking place. Now, for excitation to take place, it's got to be the exact energy level difference for this to take place, whilst for ionization, it's going to be that value or more. Now, that is for a photon. Obviously, if an electron collides with it, it's a different situation entirely, but we're just talking about a photon being absorbed by the atom. So you've got to look here and you've got to look, is there a gap of 8.81? Okay, and you would say, yes, there is, because from minus 10.38 to minus 1.57, the difference, the gap is 8.81. So you would say that the photon is absorbed and the, ele the electron is excited from its ground state into the uh, fourth energy level, the minus 1.57. Now, again, please remember, it's going to be the exact energy level difference if you're absorbing a photon from this. Now the next question, how many different photon wavelengths can be observed? Well, what we've got to say is we've got if the photon is emitted okay, when it is um, de being de-excited. So you've got to look at how many possible uh, events could be de-excited. So we'll go from the highest level, which is at 0.00, .00 okay, and you can see how
how many there's going to be as the deer excites back down to the ground state. And you can see how many there are going to be, and there's going to be six. The next, well, next set of questions will be on force, energy, and momentum. So the first question says, figure six shows two identical dummies, A and B, in a moving car. Dummy A has a seatbelt, dummy B does not have a seatbelt. Figure seven shows how the horizontal force on each dummy varies with time as the moving car is brought to rest. So the area under curve A is equal to the area under curve B. Explain why. Then secondly, explain why the same work is done on both dummies, even though the maximum force on dummy A is less than the maximum force on dummy B as shown in the diagram as shown in the graph of figure 7. So pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right so the important thing to note is for a force time graph what is or what can we find out from the graph. So the idea is the area under the graph for a force time graph is the change in momentum or the impulse. Now because this is a collision the change in momentum is the same. Now why do we know that? Well we know that because when the car crashes the momentum has gone to zero and we know that the initial velocity okay, for both dummies is going to be the same because they're in the same car and the masses of the dummies are the same as well. So they'll have the same momentum at the start, the same momentum at the end, so they'll have the same change in momentum. That was indicated when it said there are identical dummies. Now the next question is, why is the same work done on both the dummies? Well, it's because they've lost the same amount of kinetic energy. So you could say that the work done on the dummies is force times by distance or force times by displacement. Now you could indicate that whilst force A has a small force acting on it, as shown in figure seven, it will move a large distance compared with B, which has a large force and a small distance. So you can see uh, in that situation that because work done is force times by distance, okay, that the two values will equate each other out. Now you'll note okay, that it has to be the same loss in kinetic energy because they'd start with the same kinetic energy at the beginning and have the same kinetic energy at the end. Why the same at the start? Well, they've got the same mass and the same velocity. And why the same at the end? Well, they're both zero because they've stopped moving. The next question says, from this particular example, state Newton's first law of motion, and then secondly, explain how Newton's first law of motion applies to dummy B, which does not have a seatbelt on. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so what is Newton's first law of motion? This is something you've just got to memorize, and that is a body will remain in a state of rest or with uniform motion or with a constant velocity unless it's acted upon by a resultant force. An object will have inertia unless it's acted upon by a resultant force. So how does this link to dummy B? Well, dummy B will keep carry on moving because it has no seatbelt to provide a resultant force on it to change its velocity. So as a result, Okay, you would say that B is going to have inertia because there's no resultant force acting upon it until it, until it experiences a force, which will be when it hits the windscreen. The next question shows the following. Figure 2 shows a ball thrown with a velocity of 15 meters per second at an angle of 20 degrees to the horizontal. It reaches a wall 0.15 seconds after being thrown. Throughout this question, assume the air resistance is negligible. So calculate the horizontal distance D traveled by the ball. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how would you answer this question? So we're doing the horizontal distance. Now we'll notice in this particular situation that we would note that um that we, there's, no, there's going to be no horizontal force acting on this object. The only forces are in the vertical because it's a projectile. So because the horizontal force is going to be overall zero, we can use the equation that speed is equal to distance over time because there's no acceleration. So we can therefore say distance is equal to speed times by time. Now we know what the time is, 0.15, but what is going to be the speed? Now it's not 15 meters per second because that's at an angle. So what you've got to do is you've got to work out the horizontal component of that 15 meters per second. So you would do 15 cos 20, and that is your horizontal component using trigonometry, times by 0.15 to get 2.1 meters. The next question with the same example says, calculate the height gained by the ball, and then calculate the speed at which the ball hits the wall. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. 
Right, so how should you answer this particular question? Well, in the first section, what we need to do is we're trying to work out the height. So we're trying to work out the height, we've got a time and we've got a starting velocity. So we should be using SUVA, so you do S, U, V, A and T. And what you know is you know your value for U, because we know it will be um, 15 sine 20 because we're working now in the vertical because we're going to work the vertical height out we know what our value for a is going to be it's going to be minus 9.81 because it's acting against the acceleration due to gravity because the force acting on it is the weight of the object um, and we also have the time which is 0.15 seconds so therefore we want to work out height so what suvat equation can we use well we can do s equals ut plus a half at squared we work out what our vertical uh, velocity is by doing like we said before 15 sine 20 and then we pop all our values in and we get 0.66 meters now again the next question calculate the speed at which the ball hits the wall we can now use suvat again instead of trying to work out s in the previous question we can now work out v so what we can do is we can do uh, v equals u plus at so we can do v equals u plus at we know what we know what u is it's 5.13 from the previous question plus at now what's a it's minus 9.81 why minus because it's going against gravity times by 0.15 t so that will give us our value to be 3.65 now that actually isn't the overall velocity that it hits the wall at that is actually the vertical velocity so what we need to do is we now need to do pythagoras because we actually need to work out what the overall velocity is going to be because we know what our value for the vertical velocity is it's 3.65 we know what our horizontal um, velocity is going to be 14.1 from the previous uh, question that we've done so to work out the overall uh, velocity of them both combined we do Pythagoras because we say a squared equals b squared plus c squared so we can say that it's going to equal the square root of 3.65 squared plus 14.1 squared and we get 15 or 14.6 meters per second we're now going to look at some questions on the topic of current electricity. So the first question says a heating element in an electrical heater consists of a coil of wire. The heating element transfers a power of 1 kilowatt when directly connected to the main supply of 230 volts. Show that the resistance of the element is approximately 53 ohms. And the element is made from wire that has a radius of 0.137 millimeters and a resistivity of 4.9 times 10 to the minus 7 ohm meters. Calculate the length of the wire needed for the element. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers. Right, how can we do this one? Well, in this first question, we need to work out R, we're given a power and we're given a potential difference or an EMF. So therefore, we can do the equation P is equal to V squared over R, an equation given to you in your equation booklet. The only trick here is that power is going to be 1000, not 1, because we don't work in kilowatts. So we work it through and we rearrange to work out R, which is 52.9 ohms. Now, the next question, we've got resistivity. So we should be using the resistivity equation and that is rho is equal to r a over l now the trick is here we're given a radius and we've got to convert it into an area so our area is going to be pi r squared now again we don't work in millimeters we work in meters so you're going to, have to convert your 0.137 millimeters into meters you can then work out your area you've got your length okay so so you need to work out your length and you've got your resistance so what you can do is rearrange the equation make L the subject, plug the values in and you get your answer worked out. The next question says, a student builds a circuit that uses a filament lamp to heat a tank for reptiles. The circuit includes components that are designed to control the temperature of the tank. A thermistor and the lamp are positioned inside the tank. Figure 6 shows the circuit. The battery has a negligible internal resistance. Figure A shows the variation of R uh, with the temperature T for the thermistor. And, fi and figure B shows the variation um, for potential difference with current for the lamp. So the initial temperature in the tank is 20 degrees Celsius. Switch S is closed and the potential difference across the lamp is 3 volts. So that the resistance of the parallel combination of the thermistor and the lamp immediately after S is closed is approximately 2.7 ohms. Determine the resistance of the variable resistor and then determine the power of the lamp immediately after the S is closed. 
So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how would you answer this particular question? Well, it's important that you've got to use you've got to use data from figure 7. So what you'd note is because the temperature is 20 degrees, you know that the thermistor resistance from looking at figure 7 is going to be l about 11 ohms. So you look across, it says 20 degrees, so it's at 11 ohms. Now you can then also work out the resistance of the lamp from figure uh, B because we can say that resistance is equal to potential difference over current. So what we can then, then say is that we can work it out by saying let's do the value of 3 volts over um, over 0.85 because you're looking at your value for current and your value for resistance so what we've got is our resistance of our thermistor which is at about 11 ohms and the resistance of the lamp which is about 3.75 ohms what we can then say is because if we look at the circuit we can see that the thermistor and the lamp are in parallel with each other so you've got to use the parallel resistor equation which is the 1 over r total equals 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2 so 1 over r total equals 1 over 11 plus 1 over 3.75 you work it through and you get your answer to be about 2.7 ohms now it then says determine the resistance of the variable resistor well you've got to use the concept now of potential dividers so what you would say is you know the potential divider equation is going to be that v out is equal to v in um, times by R1 over R1 plus R2. So what you would then do is you could use this equation to then work out your value working it out. Now another thing you could do by saying this is as follows. What you could say is you could say that um, that the val if you look at how they split with each other you'll notice that it's a 3 to 1 split so what you can do is multiply your previous answer by 3. Now the last one it says determine the power of the lamp immediately after the switch is closed. Now this is quite a nice one because what we now have is we have the potential difference in going through the lamp when the when the switch is closed we've got the current from the previous question as well so we can say p equals vi to get our answer out to be 2.5 2.6 watts the next question says as follows so if we look on this one it says suggest how the resistance of the parallel combination of the lamp of a thermistor and the lamp is likely to change in the period immediately after s is closed on another occasion the initial temperature in the tank is again 20 degrees celsius this time the resistance of the variable resistor in figure six is increased before s is closed state and explain the effect of this change on the initial rate of temperature increase in the tank so pause the video now then then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers. Right, so how will the resistance of the parallel combination change uh, when S is closed? Well, it's the idea that the resistance of the lamp will increase whilst the resistance of the thermistor will decrease. Because when you put, when the switch is closed, when S is closed, a current will flow through the circuit. So when the current flows through the circuit, it heats up both the thermistor and the lamp but because a thermistor when the temperature goes up the resistance goes down and when the for a lamp when the temperature goes up the resistance goes up so you can make an idea regarding that and then talk about how this links to the resistance of the combination and your argument would be that you would think approximately okay that um that the idea is you don't know which one would dominate but one's going to go up one's going to go down so it might stay the same or it might change slightly because of the fact of this variance now the next question says state and explain the effect of the change on the initial rate of temperature increase in the tank now the important thing to note is the initial temperature of the tank again is 20 degrees and the resistance of various resistors increase before s is closed so this means that the initial rate of temperature will be lower because the potential difference across the lamp is reduced so therefore it won't go up as quickly now why will the why will the potential difference across the lamp reduce well it's because the resistance of the thermistor is higher and when we've got a situation like this in the potential divider situation okay you'll get more of the resistance going to the one with the more potential difference when the potential difference increases that will take more of the potential difference so there's only a fixed amount from the battery so therefore if more is being taken by the um, variable resistor well then less is being taken by the lamp so that tells us that the temperature will be lower in either the temperature increase will be lower because the lamp is getting less so therefore the power in the lamp has reduced 
Now the next question says, the question is about the initial motion of a boat and a trailer when pulled up a ramp as shown in figure 8. The boat and the trailer are pulled by a motor which is, which is connected to a 24 volt battery of negligible internal resistance. The mode is switched on at time t equals 0 and figure 9 shows how the current in the motor circuit varies with time. Determine how the total input of a 24 volt battery to the motor in the first tw 20 milliseconds. So, pause the video now. Then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how would you answer this particular question? Well, there are two methods to doing this. You'll notice that you've got a current against time graph. So what you could do is if you do, if you work this particular idea through, say you do your current against time graph, the area under the, you can determine the area under the curve. Okay, and what you can then say is you can then multiply okay, the total area, which is going to be the charge because it's a current times by, it's going to be current times by time because it's the area of a current time graph. So therefore you then multiply your total area, your charge by 24 to get out your energy with our equation. Energy is equal to charge, the area under the graph, okay, um, times by the potential difference, 24. Another way you could do it is try to determine the average current. So you would say that over the first 200 milliseconds, you could work out the average current by looking at the values on the graph. Then you could say E is equal to potential difference times by current times by time. You've got your values there and you can work out once again to be 240 joules. Now the next question says the boat and trailer are initially at rest. In the first 200 milliseconds the boat and trailer are raised to a vertical height of 3.3 times 10 to the minus 2 meters and the speed is increased at 0.85 meters per second. Assume that all the useful energy output by the motor is transferred into kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy of the boat and the trailer. The boat and the trailer have a total mass of 180 kilograms. Determine the efficiency of the motor during these first 200 milliseconds. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how would you work it through? So firstly, work out the gain in kinetic energy. So you would do the idea of increasing speed is to 0.85 meters per second and it's initially at rest, so it's a change of 0.85. So you do a half times by mass, which is given to you in the questions 180, times by velocity squared 0.85. Then you work out your potential energy by doing mass times by uh, gravity times by change in height. We've got our mass is 180. We know gravity to be 9.81. We know our change of height to be 3.3 times 10 to the minus 2. So we can work out our two values as kinetic energy is 65 joules and our potential energy as 58.3 joules. So you can work out efficiency by doing the total output is 65 plus 58. And then you can have your useful output energy that you want. And then you can work it through to be 51 or 0.51 percent or 0.51 the next question says, either of the circuits shown in figure 10A and 10, figure 10B could be used to reduce the initial current surge. So the thermistor and the fixed resistor have the same resistance where they are at the, at the temperature of the surroundings. When the surge has ended, the boat and trailer continue to move at a constant speed to the top of the ramp. Explain with reference to the properties of the thermistor and the fixed resistor why the thermistor is preferable to using the fixed resistor. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how would you answer this particular question? So it's important that you compare and you contrast your thermistor with your fixed resistor. So you would say that heating will occur when a current passes through, because we know when a current passes through a wire or a component, there is a heating effect. Now the important thing to know is what are the properties of a thermistor? Well, when the temperature of the thermistor goes up, the resistance goes down. So you would say that with less resistance, there's going to be less energy dissipated to the surroundings, so therefore there is less waste power or you could indicate that there's more PD dropped across the the motor so there's less wasted voltage you say there's less lost volts but it's important to note that with a fixed resistor you're going to get a fixed potential difference so therefore a fixed amount of um, energy being released to the surroundings as waste here because our resistance can change with temperature we know that if the temperature goes up the resistance goes down so there's less energy dissipated to the surroundings making it more efficient now let's finally look at some questions on periodic motion. Pendulums are used to make some clocks keep the correct time. Figure 13 shows a clock with a pendulum. The pendulum is made 
um, from a rigid bar of negligible mass with a large mass near the lower end. Assume that the pendulum behaves as a simple pendulum with a length equal to distance L between the point of suspension and the centre of mass of the pendulum. The pendulum must oscillate with a time period of 1.400 seconds for the clock to keep correct time. The pendulum oscillates with a period of 1.402 seconds. Um, calculate the error in the time measured by the clock in 24 hours. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how would you answer this particular question? Well, it's the idea of, well, what is the difference between the, the ideal and the, and the one you're actually given? And the difference is 0 .0, sorry, 0.002 seconds because 1.402 is the value you got. You want it to be 1.400, so it's alpine 0.002 seconds. So what you can then do is you can work out, okay, how many values that you are doing. So what you would do is you say 24, times by 60 times by 60 because that's how long it is a day divided by 1.4 because you'll notice that in theory there should be that many time periods because you're dividing it by 1.4 so you've worked out the number of seconds in the day divided by 1.4 then multiplying it by the difference which is 0 0.002 and it equals 123 seconds another way you could do it is just find the actual number of oscillations in 24 hours like we said before then find the necessary number of oscillations in 24 hours then you would find the difference between the two which is 88 multiplied by 1.4 which is how many you should have and you get 123 seconds right the next question says show that the length is approximately 0.5 meters then the owner of the clock wants to make the clock more accurate by attaching a small additional mass to the pendulum and um, explain where the owner should attach the small additional mass and then the clock is moved to a warmer room cause the rigid bar to increase in length. Explain how the owner must move the small additional mass in order for the clock to keep accurate time. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so the first one is asking to work out L. Now you should know for a simple pendulum, T is equal to two pi times by the square root of L over G. That is an equation given to you in your equation booklet. So you can say T equals two pi square root L over G, pop your numbers in, G equals, equals 9.81, so you get your answer to be 0.49 meters. Now the next question is asking where you should place the additional mass. Now the idea is the additional mass should be placed above Above the existing centre of mass, because when you when you put your additional mass there, your new centre of mass will now be nearer the point of suspension. So that would mean your effective length of the pendulum is smaller. So as a result, it'll be more accurate because it wanted to be more accurate by being been going from 1.402 to 1.400. So you want a shorter time period, which is achieved by having a shorter length of the pendulum. Now the next question says, uh, how must the owner move the small additional mass in order for the clock to keep accurate time if the rigid bar has increased in length? Well, the additional mass needs to be placed even higher because now we've got a longer bar, so we need to have a eff shorter effective length. The next question says, the seat of a bicycle is attached to the main body of the bicycle by a single vertical spring. The spring has a spring constant of 7.2 times 10 to the 4 newtons per meter. Uh, the mass of the rider is 68 kilograms. Assume the weight of the rider is fully supported by the spring and that the mass of the seat is negligible. Show that the time period for free oscillations of the seat is approximately 0.2 seconds when the rider is sitting on it. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so again, what do you want to do? The oscillating up and down, it's a spring. We look on our equation sheet, t equals two pi times by the square root of m over k. You've got m in the question, 68. You've got k, 7.2 times 10 to the four. You know what two pi is, so you can work it through and it's 0 0.19 seconds. Now, figure 10 shows the bicycle and rider approaching a series of speed bumps that are equally spaced. When the bicycle travels over the speed bumps of a, at a certain speed, the rider experiences large amplitude vertical oscillations. Identify and explain the effect that causes the large amplitude oscillations. Then the rider experiences large amplitude oscillations when the bicycle travels at 5.8 meters per second. Calculate the distance between the adjacent speed bumps. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. 
Right, so what is this particular idea? Well, this idea is resonance. So large amplitude oscillations are caused when it is oscillating at resonance. So when do you get resonance occurring? Well, you get resonance occurring when the when the driving force or the driving frequency of the of the force is equal to the natural frequency of the object. So it's important to note that you've got to say in the question what's causing this driving this driving frequency, this driving force, and it's the car. It's the bicycle going over the speed bumps that's causing a periodic force on your object so that will cause a driving frequency and that equals natural frequency of the bike you will get resonance now the next question says calculate the distance between the speed bumps now here you've got a dis you've got a speed so what you can say is distance is equal to speed times by time now you've got to recognize that the time is going to be the actual natural free it's going to be the natural frequency of your system so what you can do is you it's the same time period you worked out in the first question because that is the time period of the, of the natural frequency okay linked in there of this particular system so what you can say is this time period is our natural time period so you can say distance equals speed times by time we've got speed we had time in the previous question we get 1.1 meters let's have a look at our next question a student determines the period t of the oscillations for a mass spring system by measuring 10 oscillations of the system the measurements were repeated so table 1 shows these measurements calculate the mean value of for t then calculate the percentage uncertainty in your mean value for t so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, for this first one, what you need to do is you need to add up all your values and divide by the number you've added up by to work out your mean. So you work that through, and then what you need to do is you then need to divide it by 10, because remember the table is showing 10t. So to show 1t, you get your average value for 10t, and you divide by 10 to get 1.27 seconds. Now the next question is asking to work out the percentage uncertainty in your mean value. So how you do that is as follows. You've got to firstly work out your absolute uncertainty now when you do repeats the way in which you work out your absolute uncertainty is by doing range over 2 so what you would do is you would get your range you would then divide it by 2 now again remember that is for 10 T so you then divide that by 10 to find out the absolute uncertainty for T you would then take your value for absolute uncertainty divided by this previous value we just worked out the mean value the mean value for t and times it by 100 and you get 0.8 percent now the next question says the mass on the spring was 0.400 plus or minus 0.008 so calculate the spring constant k then calculate the percentage uncertainty in your answer for k so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, so how would you work out this particular question? So what you've got to remember is, okay, that we say that uh, t is equal to 2 pi times by the square root of m over k. You've got your value for m in this question, 0 0.400. In the previous question, you worked out your value for t. So what you can do is you can substitute them into the equation and then rearrange it to make k the subject. And what you can then do is work out your value, k, and then work it out to be about 9.8 newtons per meter. Now the next one, calculate the percentage of uncertainty in your answer. Now because we know that we'll have the values of, we'll say t equals 2 pi times by the square root of m over k. So when we rearrange that and we work out m, so we work out m to be the subject, what we can say is that we're going to have our equation, okay, of being, okay, linking the two concepts together, okay, you would have to say that m is going to equal k times by t squared times times by 4 times by pi squared now obviously 4 and pi squared are irrelevant in working out uncertainties because they're constants so you know that k is just a single value there and you've got t squared and they're being multiplied together so you've got to add your percentage uncertainties now because t is being squared you've got to times your percentage uncertainty by 2 so what you would do is you would say that your value is going to in m is going to be equal to the percentage uncertainty of k plus plus two times the percentage uncertainty of t. Now you worked out the percentage uncertainty of t in the previous question. Now to work out the percentage uncertainty Okay, in M, what you would do is you would do 0.008 divided by 0.400 and you can work it through like that.
Now, also as well, sorry there, when I worked it, I put M to be the subject. In fact, it would be K as the subject, my apologies. It would just mean there would be M over T squared. And once again, when you divide two numbers together, when you divide two numbers, you add the percentage uncertainties to work out the overall percentage of the value. So again, you're still adding them. Okay, so you add your percentage uncertainty of M, add your percentage of uncertainty of T, which is double because it's T squared, and you get your answer to be 3.6%. Let's have a look at our next question. So to investigate dampening in a system, the amplitude A of the oscillations was measured until a total of 50 oscillations were completed. Figure 11 shows the variation of amplitude with time. The dampening in the mass spring system causes the amplitude to decrease. The time taken for the amplitude of the system to decrease by half is constant and is called the half-life. So determine a reliable value for the half-life of this system. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, now it's important to note in this question it says select a reliable value. So how do you get a reliable value? Well, you will first you work out your half-life by getting two values on your graph where one is half the other. So for example, 4 and 2, 3 and 1.5, and you would go down, you would read the value for time for both values, and the difference between the two is going to be the half-life. But to gain a reliable value, you need to be doing at least three, this, this, this process, three times and averaging the result. So you might want to do 4 and 2, 3 and 1.5, 2 and 1. Work out your values for all those different halfens and then um, average them out and you get your average value for the half-life for the system. Remember to get a reliable value for a half-life, you've got to do it about three times at least to remove any effects of randomness. So you should be getting an answer in the order of 23 to 26 seconds. So I hope you've enjoyed and you found this revision session useful. So in this revision session, if we've been successful and learned today, we should be able to answer A-level physics examination style questions, assess our understanding of A-level physics and understand what topics we need to improve upon for A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching this revision session on paper one topics for AQA A-level physics on the 2022 examination topics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.